replay. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. So there's going to be like two screens up that we're going to look at. So for the case studies, the first thing that you need to know is that I will never give you a case study for something you haven't learned before. So this one is about neurodevelopmental disorders. So Mikey, your case study number one, is going to be some sort of neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, when we move on to next module, I don't even know what it is, maybe anxiety, it could be somebody that has either neuro, something neurodevelopmentally or anxiety, like we'll build on as we keep going, but I'll never give you like somebody with PTSD before we've gotten there. So that'll give you a kind of clue of how to do it. So for the case studies at the bottom of each of them, this is what you want to fill out. So you can just copy and paste this to a Word document. Make sure you stick your name at the top. Um, but you're just going to you're going to conceptualize the case and we're going to fill this out together. So this one is the case of Mikey. Um, let's be like elementary school. Does somebody want to read this for us? You can read it out loud. I can if my internet holds out. <laughs> Go for it. Um, all right. Case study number one is Mikey. Mikey is a 10-year-old male in fourth grade. He lives with his mother and older sister and goes to his father's house on the weekends. Mikey is funny, good at math, helps his family take care of pets, loves to watch WWE, loves dogs, and likes to play board games. Mikey's parents were asked to attend a meeting at school to discuss some concerns, specifically Mikey has difficulty managing his materials and keeping himself organized. Mikey frequently loses his work and does not complete tasks. His teachers describe him as impulsive and messy. His teachers also report he is experiencing social difficulties like short-lived relationships and fighting with his peers. According to his teachers, Mikey is underperforming and sometimes seems lost. Mikey's parents share some concerns at home as well. Mikey often fights with his sibling and has difficulty sleeping. His room is messy, as are his notebooks and backpack after school. He loses things easily, avoids homework, resists bedtime, and is difficult to wake in the morning. He often has poor hygiene and is slow with his routines, i.e. eating breakfast, getting ready for school. Mikey reports he wants to make friends, be able to find his schoolwork, have good friends, and be better at kickball and wrestling. Right. So there's the case study of Mikey. And so what you want to do, and you guys have been doing this in pre prac too, um, you know, you're going to put Mikey's name by the client and then the date that you're seeing Mikey. So we're going to pretend that you're seeing him today. So when it says presenting signs and symptoms of the client, you can just bullet these, but you want to be sure, and this was the feedback I gave you in pre prac too, that you are speaking from the client's point of view. So you want to be really objective during this part with the presenting signs and symptoms. So the, the way to do that is client reports, Mikey reports, Mikey's parents report. And you're not going to paraphrase anything for this. So you're not going to be like, oh, Mikey's parents report that he can't sit still, right? It doesn't say that anywhere in there. So you want to be really clear um, just for these case studies as you learn how to do it what his signs and symptoms are. So I'll give you an example and then I'll ask you to give me an example, okay? So let's see, Mikey, doo, 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 doo. so here's one, you can just copy and paste it. Mikey has difficulty managing his materials and keeping himself organized. So we're gonna copy it, we're gonna paste it right over here and that's gonna be bullet number one. So anybody can come off um, mute and tell me what the next one might be. Uh, Mikey frequently loses his work and does not complete tasks. Yep, perfect. So you're just gonna copy and you're gonna paste it over here. Next. His teachers describe him as impulsive and messy. You got it. We're gonna copy and paste it. So you keep those together 
Um, even if they're a little different, you just keep them in the same line. Um, I would. It's up to you. I mean, yeah, I would. Because his teachers are reporting. Like, this is what his teachers are reporting. I wouldn't put it in the same line as, like, what his parents are reporting. But because it's both coming from his teachers, I would leave it together. What's another one? Uh, my te teacher. Oh, no, you go ahead. Me? Yeah. His, his, sorry. His teachers also report he's experiencing social difficulties. You got it. And short-lived relationships. Short-lived relationships. Would you ever go, um, question, sorry. Would you yeah, ever go, go shorthand and just write teachers report impulsive, comma, messy, comma, social difficulties? Or you yes. want, you can, do, yeah. Yeah, you would, especially if you were like in a clinical setting doing this, right? You would have your own shorthand. And remember, again, your clients can see your notes. And then you want to make sure that any other provider that's working with your clients understands what your notes are saying, too, in case they go to them. So you can use shorthand, but just know that your notes can be seen by folks, too. For this I would say be for these assignments as you're learning, because they're going to get harder. Mikey's pretty easy. I think we can all know what's going on with Mikey, but they're going to get harder. So you want to make sure you get every single symptom in there. What's another one? Uh, Mikey is underperforming and sometimes seems lost. You got it. Uh-oh. It's another one. We say Mikey's parents share some concerns at home, such as, and then go into all the ones so, they list. I would say Mikey's parents report. Yes, sorry. So what did they report? Um, that Mikey often fights with his sibling and has difficulty sleeping. Yep. It's another one. Mikey's room is messy and his notebooks and backpacks are as after school. Who is reporting that? Um, his parents report mm -hmm. that his room is messy. Yep. What else? His parents also report he loses things easily, avoids homework, or assists bedtime, and is difficult to wake in the morning. Yep. What else? Like his parents report he often has poor hygiene and so with his routines. Got it. Anything else? You would do the Mikey reports that he wants to make friends. Is able to find his schoolwork, have good friends, and get better at kickball and wrestling. Yeah, because what does that tell you? He has goals. Right. And he also has some awareness, right? Awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So there's all of his signs and symptoms. So what you want to do is now looking at all of these signs and symptoms, and we know that it's gonna be something in the neurodevelopmental category of the DSM. You wanna to go to your DSM and you wanna to go to that chapter, neurodevelopmental disorders, so page 35. And you wanna look at the clinical criteria and try to figure out what's going on with Mikey. So. There's a couple ways that you're going to do this. 
you have to understand that as LMHCs, you have the ability to diagnose somebody with a mental health disorder. This is a huge responsibility, right? So when you diagnose somebody with something, it goes into their medical chart forever and ever. And I'm sure some of you guys have seen with your kids at school, sometimes their charts are this big and they have 75 different diagnoses in there, right? So you want to be very, very careful with diagnosis. Um, as an LMHC under supervision, you will never do this alone. You will you will always diagnose with your supervisor. And then once you go into whatever practice you want to go into, you'll decide as the LMHC whether you want to use diagnosis in your practice or not. If you're taking insurance, you have to diagnose in that first 45 minutes or you know hour session. If you're not, you can decide what you want to do. Um, so with this comes great responsibilities. So you want to be as thorough as you can when making a diagnosis for somebody. So you're going to look at the criteria, the presenting signs and symptoms of the client, and you're going to, you're going to guess really, like, what do you think is going on with Mikey? And so you might think like three or four things are going on with Mikey. So anything that you think the provisional diagnosis, this first diagnosis with code and specifiers is your provisional diagnosis. This is like, this is what's going on. Your rule outs are anything that you think might be going on, but you need more information to rule out. So the language around that can be very confusing. Um, so maybe Mikey is anxious, but you don't have enough information to know that yet. So you would put anxiety under here because it's, you need more information to rule it out. So take a couple minutes, look in the DSM, look at the criteria for what you think is going on with Mikey. And let's talk about what you think and we'll make a list. And then I'll show you how to write it out. Let's do it this way. When you find something that you think it might be, put it in the chat and then we'll look at the chats together. So everybody's putting ADHD into the chat. Is there anybody that doesn't agree with that? So now let's look at the clinical criteria for ADHD because there's a whole bunch of things it could be. So on page 68, it starts 68 and 69. You look at the diagnostic criteria so it says a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity, impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development as characterized by one and two. So inattention. So looking at all of those criteria under inattention, which ones do you think that fit according to Mikey? And the ones that fit, you're going to list under your problem list. So does everybody see that? A, often fails to give close attention to details. B, difficulty sustaining attention. You're going to see those? Which ones do you think fit?
I think D fits, fails to finish schoolwork, chores. Mm -hmm. Which one was I that? said D. I said D, E, and G. D, E, and G. Okay, so we'll go D, E. You're going to write these out when you do them. So D is often does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties in the workplace. Yep. E, difficulty organizing tasks and activities. And F, avoids dislikes or reluctant to engage in tasks like schoolwork. <coughs> Great. Does anybody see any other ones under inattention that might work? I would also say a, um, I, because like doing chores or maybe like daily hygiene would fall into that, but I would like need more information on that as well. Okay. So uh, I thought A for the same reason fails to pay often give fails to give close attention to details for the hygiene and for poor hygiene. I'm just like paraphrasing right now. When you do it, write it out. But it'll take you seven years to write it out. E, difficulty. G loses things. Anything else? Okay, that's under inattention. And then when you go to two, hyperactivity or impulsivity, is there anything there that fits? Anything? Uh, difficulty sleeping could be E, the on the go, driven by a motor. Restless. Okay. Is there anything on that list that you want more information about when it comes to Mikey? You're only getting a little snapshot, but is there anything on the hyperactivity and impulsivity list that if Mikey was in front of you, you would want to ask questions about? Potentially D, unable, to, often unable to play or engage in activities quietly. I mean, there's the social difficulties um, and lack of friends as reported, so potentially. I think I'd want to know more about A, like what's he doing in the classroom? I know they say he's impulsive, um, but like what is he fidgeting or maybe even B, does he leave his seat? I was also thinking I, because um, often interrupts or intrudes on others. Um, I don't know if that is a social struggle for him. No, oh, operating on What about how long it's been going on? Mm -hmm. So frequency and duration are really important. You always want to know the frequency and the duration of what's happening.
This is hard to read. Okay, so based on this criteria, right, that we know that's happening, A, D, E, G, I, what would his provisional diagnosis be? You guys put ADHD in the chat, which is correct, but you have to be more specific. For ADHD inattentive type? Mm -hmm. So when you write it out, you're going to want to put the code first. So what's the code for that? F90.0. Does everybody see where to find the code? So F90.0, ADHD, predominantly inattentive presentation. So it's on page 69, like almost down to the bottom of the page. It says specify whether it's combined presentation. So if it was both inattention and hyperactivity were met, if it's predominantly inattention or if it's predominantly hyperactive. And then if you change, if you turn to page 70, there's specifiers. So it says, is it mild, is it moderate, or is it severe? What do you guys think at this point, knowing what you know? I would say moderate, because we need more information to label whether or not the duration and the frequency to know if it's severe or not to make that determination. Perfect. So you've got your diagnosis and then it asks for supporting rationale. So you're gonna go right back down here and this is gonna tell you your supporting rationale, right? These are all the things that it said in the DSM and that's your rationale. Your rationale is always gonna come from the, DF, from the DSM. So then we've got this part right here still, right? So there was a question about the hyperactivity part. Um, you know, is he driven by a motor? Is he restless? I know that Sue had a question, but I don't think I copied, but like um, over oh, right here, what's he doing in the classroom? How, why is, you know, how is he engaging with friends? Is he fidgety? Is he leaving a seat? So what diagnosis do you think might be going on that you need more information to rule out? This would be your rule out diagnosis. Mixed type. Got it. What's the code? Um, F90.2. ADHD, what's it say, mixed Combined. presentation? Combines, it says. Combined. combined presentation. And then again on page 70, mild, moderate, or severe? What do you guys think? I would probably go conservatively with moderate again because there's not enough information to rule out a severe type uh, with combined presentation. Perfect. And then you just put the more information needed. And this is perfect, right? You guys are all counselors already. You know that you're not just going to get at face value. You need to ask more questions. Um, so that's perfect. Now, Z codes, who remembers what the Z codes are? You guys remember? I think it was in the first module, maybe. Yeah. 
Anybody? Anybody remember? So it is. It will be the psychosocial and environment fa factors that can impact the client's mental health. Perfect. So a Z code uh -huh. is not billable. You can't bill it for insurance. You can't like get reimbursement for it. But it's the language that clinicians use to talk to each other. So when you're doing a turn on the page, um, they used to be called F codes, but now they're called Z codes. So when for these assignments, anytime that you are doing a case conceptualization, you have to include the Z codes. Okay, I can't say that loud enough. You have to include the Z codes. These are where a lot of people miss points. So they're all listed. This is a Roman numerals, which is not, I don't even know what this means. LXVI. That's the page in the front. LXVI. Anybody know what that is? And it says at the bottom, relational problems. LXVI is the page in the front. You guys able to find it? Not real user friendly. LXVI. And if you look down at the bottom of the page, it says relational problems, and that's where your Z code starts. So parent child relational problems, problems related to the family environment, educational problems. Oh, excuse me, occupational problems, housing problems, and so on. You guys see those? Okay, so we want to list out the Z codes, but what might be going on with Mikey if you were going to share this information with another clinician? And it's probably, I would say ballpark is two to three Z codes per case study. So what might be your top two to three for Mikey? I think um, I would go with Z55.3, underachievement in school. Great. I'd probably say Z62.891, sibling relational problem. And also the parent-child relational problem, Z62. Two eight two twenty. Z six two eight twenty. Z six two eight twenty. Perfect. Okay, so there's your Z codes. So let's just review. You've got Mikey, the date you saw him, has presenting signs and symptoms came right from the narrative. Your provisional diagnosis is F90.0, ADHD, and attentive type moderate. So you have the code, you have the diagnosis, and then you have the specifier. And then you have to include the supporting rationale. So you just take that right from the DSM. Here's my supporting rationale of why this is happening. And then you've got to rule out because there were other things going on that you need to know more information about in order to rule out. And you guys decided on F90.2 ADHD combined presentation moderate. And the more information that you needed were around hyperactivity and impulsivity. So what's it mean for him to be on the go, restless? 
Does he engage in activities quietly? What's his friend relationships like? And what is he doing in the classroom? Is he fidgeting? Is he leaving his seat? So you want to get, and then does he struggle socially intruding with others? So you want to get more information about this next time. There's also not a lot about frequency and duration. So you wanted to make sure that what was going on is really ADHD and not some developmentally appropriate issue for a five-year-old, right? Um, Mikey's older than that, but just making sure that we're thinking about developmentally appropriate um, diagnosis. And then you have your DSM-5 Z codes. So these are the other things that are going on, relational problems. I'm gonna write that right there so you know and you remember. That if this record was to go to another clinician, you can sum up what you know about Mikey so far using the Z codes, but the Z codes are not billable. You can't bill insurance for them. The next thing you need to do is a comprehensive problem list. So you wanna rank order which problems are the most important, the ones that you're gonna work on first. So in the case of Mikey, what is the first thing that you wanna work on? And it might look different, right? Everybody's might look a little bit different, but what are some things that you wanna work on with him? And think through a clinical lens, right? So your job is going to be to reduce symptoms, right? So, so what's going on with Mikey is no longer interfering with his major life functions, learning, school, relationships. So what's like one thing you wanna work on with him? Probably organization or, or I guess overall executive functioning. Mm -hmm. What else? on social difficulties and pure conflicts. What else? Maybe sleep patterns? Mm -hmm. But one more. Probably something to do with his hygiene. Yep, perfect. Hygiene. Good spell. All right, so here's your problem list. These are the things you're going to work on with Mikey. So we need some short term goals and some long term goals for each thing. Right. So thing number one, organization and executive functioning. And we want goals to be short term, measurable, achievable. So Mikey comes back to counseling. So what might be one short term goal for Mikey? And we want to make sure we say the goal and how much time it's gonna to take to get there and how you're gonna measure it. So Mikey will what? We could say something like Mikey will write down school assignments every Monday for the week. Beautiful. So then Mikey's homework is he's going to write down his school assignments. You're going to work with him on an organizational strategy to do that. And then when he comes back to counseling the next week, you're going to check in to see if he wrote down his assignments. Perfect. What about social difficulties and peer conflicts? Mikey will... You, maybe something along the lines of Mikey will have two positive interactions a week with his peers during lunch. Mm -hmm. How would you measure that? Uh, probably through like a teacher observation or teacher reports. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Sleep patterns. 
Like you will. Think very small. Uh, like you will go to bed at nine o'clock, three nights out of seven. Perfect. And then hygiene. Mikey will. Mikey will shower every other day. Great. For a week. For a week. Yep. So now you have really measurable things. So remember, though, you're not school counselors. You're mental health counselors. So this could take Mikey two months to do. That's okay. You don't have to treat him and street him, right? You're going to be with him through this journey. So it's okay that the short-term goals don't happen in the first week. And then long-term goals, you're going to do the same thing. So thinking about the end of treatment, what would Mikey's goal be? Like, what would a long-term goal for him be? Something you can work towards, like, all the way through. Could it be like, Mikey will pass fourth grade. There you go. That's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> and that one's easy to measure, right? Show me your report card. Okay, what about social difficulties? Mikey will make two new friends by the end of the year. Yeah. Sleep patterns. Mikey will go to bed at 9 p.m. daily. Great. And should we put like a time limit, like by the end of the school year, same thing? Is there a time limit for these long terms or is it okay to go more open? I think it's okay to go more open because that's your, that's your long-term goal, right? We're going to get there someday, Mikey. And then what about hygiene? Mikey will shower every day. Mikey will shower every day. Mikey will not smell anymore. Perfect. Every day is two words. All right. So here's your goals. These are the things that you're going to do with them. How are you going to do it? So remember, this is not a treatment class. This is a diagnosis class. So this can be vague. You don't have to be like, I'm going to do CBT every day, like it, you can say like, oh, just CBT, but think about what is the best course of treatment for this diagnosis? What do you need to do? Who do you need, who else do you need to talk to? Referral to a medical doctor also. Would yep. you need a referral? Yep. Or a psychiatrist. Yep. Yeah. What else? Uh, I'm thinking about behavioral intervention. Great. You can be that vague on this. Who else do you want to talk to? Teachers. Who? I said teachers. There you go. Yep. Go. Parents as well for the bedtime. Yep. Counseling parents. Yep. So maybe a little family counseling. Yep. Perfect. So you see how you're hitting all angles, like holistically, you're going you're gonna to talk to the PCP, you're going to talk to the school, because we know that ADHD has to be across two or more settings. So making sure that it's happening at home, it is happening at school and other places. You're going to put in some behavioral interventions with Mikey that you're going to work on, and then you're going to do some family counseling. I would say family counseling and psychoeducation. 
around what ADHD is, what the best course of treatment is. And then lastly, this is something that we always want to consider for every client that we're working with are any ethical or cultural considerations. So ethical and cultural, let's start with cultural. Cultural can be anything, right? So it could be Mikey's race, his gender, his age, his um, maturity level, his cognitive abilities, his socioeconomic status. Um, like those are all things that you want to consider. So knowing what you know about Mikey, what are some cultural considerations you want to learn more about to take um, for his treatment? Like, what are you curious about? His family system, since he lives with his mom and goes to his dad's on the weekends. I might want to know what the structure at the house, at both houses and parenting style is like. Mm -hmm. So parenting style. What else are you curious about? Um, going more into his relationship with his siblings. And like, what does that even look like in his house? What does it look like in his family? Like explore, exploring, is it normal to fight with your siblings? Is that something that your family looks down on or thinks is normal? Yep. Anything else? Maybe oh, family. Oh, maybe his family's um, like what they think about school. Do they support school? Are they positive about education and school? Yes. So family's belief systems about everything, right? Education for sure, um, but parenting style, all of it. I also, whenever you're working with kids, developmental level. So is what Mikey's doing appropriate for a fourth grader? Is it not appropriate for a fourth grader? So just something to consider. And then um, socioeconomic status is always something you want to consider as well. Any ethical considerations for Mikey? What might be an ethical consideration to make sure that you're following the ACA Code of Ethics when you're working with Mikey? What do you need to do? A relief to speak to the school? Yep. Anything else? I mean, this is going to be every time. So is, it, is it something you list, but confidentiality? Mm -hmm. And what are the laws around confidentiality for Mikey, right? Is Mikey 12? If Mikey's 12, then that has a different kind of connotation than if he's over 12 or under 12. Thinking about kids live within the context of their families. So whenever you're treating kids, making sure that you're you're, you know, treating the family as well, like including the family. Anything else ethically? Do you break out informed consent? Say it again. Do you break out in this section informed consent, like when you would break confidentiality the limits? No, you don't have to. Like, I know that you know when to break confidentiality. Um, so I'm not worried about that. But just knowing that it's your ethical responsibility to maintain confidentiality, unless he's hurting someone or someone's hurting him. He's going to hurt himself. All right. So I feel like this looks really good. 
um, as you can see, it's more than just like listing everything. We really want you to think through all of the things that are presented to you, the diagnosis that you think is happening, the rule outs, very, very important, what more information you need, your Z codes, your problem list, short-term goals, long-term goals, some interventions, and any ethical and cultural considerations. You're gonna follow this formula for every single case study for the rest of the semester. The case studies do get harder. So as you learn about more things, there might be more rule outs or more diagnosis that you might have, right? Especially when we get into anxiety, depression, PTSD, that kind of stuff. Um, you're gonna have to really look at the criteria and try to figure out what's going on. Questions, comments? Does it feel hard? Does it feel okay? Hennessy, will you be the one that you typed out? Because I was trying to type and trying to look and trying to follow along. Will you share that with us yeah. or do we need, because it's, oh yeah. I yeah. want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, I'll share that with you. And, um, you know, you just put it in your own writing or whatever and upload right, it, right? right? I, Everybody know. gets an A on the first one, but yeah, I'll share it. And then this video is recorded as well. So you can go back and reference the video if you want to. Just like any other assignment, you can send this to me. So for the next one, you can send it to me before it's due. And I'll look at it and I'll let you know what's missing, if anything's missing. And this will get easier. Like it's supposed to be kind of tedious right now. So you're not missing any steps. But once, especially once you get into your internship, like you guys know what anxiety looks like. You know what ADHD looks like, right? So it'll get less tedious as you see patterns, but I want to make sure that you're really depending on the criteria in the DSM. It also demonstrates how subjective it is. You know, if you have strep throat, you go to the doctor and they swab it and they, they say you have strep throat, but this is why sometimes you'll get 17 different diagnoses for one person. Any other questions about this? Good. Everybody feels. Can I ask an unrelated question? Yeah. Can I ask a question that's uh, unrelated to this though, but to to the when we take videos? Yeah. How how do we send them when it's more than ten minutes long? Because I'm having to chop off some of them. Can if I try to it? upload it. No, I'm going to hit stop recording. I, I don't know. Um, this is what